Leadership. In this world of conflicted interests and polemic politics, we need it more than ever. But in a post-industrial networked age, we seem to want more bottom-up than top-down. The Arab Spring, the Tea Party, and Occupy Wall Street demonstrate the power of leaderless phenomenons. So how do we reconcile having less control with retaining inspiring command over an organization? And does a more collaborative approach give the community-oriented Pacific Northwest a competitive advantage on the global stage? As we'll learn from a visionary entrepreneur and an inspirational soccer coach, it's about designing a new model for motivation. I'm Hanson Hossein. Welcome to Four Peaks. Gavin Kelly climbed to the top of the peak of entrepreneurship by jumping off the career ladder at Microsoft. He co-founded the Seattle-based design firm Artifact five years ago. It was named one of the top small businesses in the United States by Inc. Magazine, and it just expanded to San Francisco. Yet, despite this business success, Artifact's overall mission is to create a preferable future for humanity. How does Gavin lead his for-profit company with a bold mandate like that? Gavin, welcome. Thank you. Great so, so this, this creating a preferable future for humanity, how does a leader practically inspire his employees with, a, with that kind of mission? Well, I think it's about understanding your purpose. It's not about what you do, or, or it's really about why you do it. And if you can understand that and you can express your purpose and you can rally people behind it, then you're going to have alignment uh, towards uh, a different type of outcome as a business. And what kind of outcome are you actually looking for? Uh, we want to change, uh, change business on, on one hand and change the way we think about work as a, as a place uh, to go and, you know, design and, and a place in which we, uh, you know, and we, the ways in which we change our lives through that. Now why is that <laughs> so important to you? Uh, it's important to me. I, I, I'll, I'll tell you a story. It's, uh, it started when I got fired. By who? I got fired by an employee. So uh, it, it sounds a little bit odd, but when an employee uh, leaves your company, they're firing you huh. as an owner. And one of the things we realized is that what we'd done is we'd bought a lot of baggage from companies that we'd worked at before, and we had to rethink what it meant to run a business. Was that your first employee to leave then? Is that why no. you felt like, well, so why was that particular departure such a, uh, had such an impact on you? He, he said a couple of things. One was that I don't have a phone, and the other was I can't work from home. And we're like, that's an odd reason to leave. Why don't you have a phone? And he said, well, you never asked. And he said, well, I thought everyone should get a phone. And so he felt there was some kind of inequality. The other was... Uh, so wasn't that not... In my mind, that sounds a little petty. Is that the kind of person you actually want to have around? Though? Well, it's about inequality and about policy. And, and the other was an ability to work from home. We didn't have a policy about working from home. And we didn't say you couldn't work from home, but he said uh, that he didn't think he could. And you mentioned that this was based on policies that you had brought from your previous employer. I, I, I suspect you're talking about your life mm -hmm. at Microsoft, right? Sure. So that's a very different culture there. So why did you bring that Microsoft culture when you started your own company? It's convenient. It's what you know. All of those things about reviews and structure and titles, they're all things that you inherited that there's an expediency in bringing those things and putting them into place so you can get busy, get busy running your business quickly. So how did you as a leader then find the courage to break away from the comfort of what you already knew in, in a very uncomfortable, risky situation, which is your own company where you're in charge? How did you make that jump? How do you make, well, you step out into the void, you know, and that's it. You, you, you learn through those failures. Uh, that's, that's one of the ways. And so how do you feel now then after having been fired by your employee? Um, do you feel like the changes you've made have actually had an impact on the way that you run your company? Absolutely. So when we looked at the company, all the policies we had in place, they were, counter in, they were counterproductive. Uh, one of the, when we looked at our culture, we feel there's three things uh, that we wanted to do as business. One was to deliver 
absolute best quality that we could as a company. And the second was uh, profitability. And the third was to create a great place to work. Now, as a business owner, it's a little bit counterintuitive to say that profitability comes second. Uh, we knew as a, uh, as a company that should we do great work, profitability would follow. So then the question is about how do you do great work? And how do you do great work? Uh, it's about understanding motivations. Uh, if you think about how people do that are at their best, you understand what, and you as a leader has to motivate them to do great work. Uh, but it doesn't come from us. It doesn't come extrinsically. That motivation is intrinsic. So it comes from within you. So we started after this, we, we looked at uh, what are the motivators for people when they come to work every day. And we found, we found that there was a lot of research out there that it has very little to do with the carrots and sticks that you apply. It has very little to do with uh, bonuses and so forth. It has more to do with the things that are meaningful for people. And we looked at someone like Daniel Pink, who's done a lot of work around uh, motivation and intrinsic motivation. And he came up with three things, autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Autonomy is about treating people like grown-ups. So how do these business philosophies apply in practice? How do you translate that in the workplace? Uh, it's not through a mission statement. It's not through words. It's through your actions. It's through the policies that you put in place. And that's, that was some of the things that we learned. Your policies are, are a way in which you express how you feel about people and how you, f how you feel about business. So as an example, uh, the ability to work from home is one of those. But another is understanding that life is a little bit messy and life and work is a little bit blurred. And so enabling people to take uh, a sabbatical from work to recharge or to deal with uh, family or life issues enables us to retain that relationship. So that's a, that's a fundamental one where we value that these people are part of our community. So has, has this leadership shift actually produced the results that you want? Yes, yes. And I think uh, one of those outcomes is that we were able to retain our employees and retain them longer. Uh, and that's given the costs, you know, recruiting and so forth, a, a very significant cost for a company. The last thing you want to do is lose people. Uh, and there are, there are other costs to that as well. Now, Artifact is a design firm. You're specifically involved in the creative process. Are these principles, do you think, specific primarily to your firm or to people involved in creativity? Could they easily be used or applied in other organizations? Uh, absolutely. I think, I think it comes down to changing the way we think about our relationship with, uh, with people. And as business owners, uh, one of those things that has to change is your level of trust. And this isn't just about creative people. This is about sort of our 20th century attitudes to work, which is you're going to come in and you're going to sit down and I'm going to watch you do work because I don't trust you. Uh, and what, the way that it has to change is that if I trust you to do great work uh, and trust you that the work will get done, that changes that dynamic. So no longer do I have to have you in the office. I don't have to watch you doing work. I, I trust that the work is going to get done. Why did that shift even happen? Did we all, all of a sudden become more mature and accountable? Or did, was there some kind of cultural shift? I think those, I, again, I think those are legacy issues that have been carried over from, uh, from the previous century. And I think uh, we have new ways in which we do work, uh, telecommuting, and we're always connected now through, through phones and tablets and, and whatever it is. I'm never really away from work. Whereas 20 years ago, 30 years ago, work was a place you went to, whereas now work is something that you do. We've heard and we've seen all the tech companies that give free food, free drinks. You guys go the extra step. You actually have kegs in your office where they get yeah. beer, right? Yes. So could they have a beer any time of day? Any time of the day. You can have a beer for breakfast. If you <laughs> and how does that improve productivity? Well, we, we joke that when uh, whether there's a correlation between beer consumption and productivity uh, and how tightly those lines were coupled, uh, we saw a a spike in uh, beer consumption for the first couple of weeks. And it's but good it's beer too, isn't it? It's very good beer. Uh, but once the novelty wore off, it was just beer on tap. Uh, but it's one of those things where you understand that people work very hard, they work with long hours, and uh, creating a social space is very important as well. Well, that's interesting because we've talked about a bit about policies in the workplace, but it seems to me that space, the configuration, is also important for the kind of leadership that you want to affect. Hmm. What are you doing in that respect? Uh, I think the, sp the space itself reflects our attitude uh, 
to hierarchy. So we have a totally open office. Uh, we have no offices for anyone, either, not, the, not the owners or uh, anyone else. Uh, and now we're redesigning the space and having the space redesigned by the employees. So you have no titles and no. there's no prefer. You don't have a corner office no. with a great view of Lake Union no. or anything like that. No. And, and you don't miss that and no. your employees appreciate the fact that you sacrifice so much? Yes. <laughs> but, but, but again, it's uh, getting away from those old ideas around uh, ego and title and ladders and focusing not on climbing but focus on doing great work. So all of this, how does it actually result in great work? Look at some of the design work that you have done and some of the consultations you've done. The, uh, the, the, the future of camera, for example, mm -hmm. the printer. Um, would, would those have happened if you had had a top-down Microsoft approach to doing I don't business? think so. I don't think so. And I, I, here's why. And I think it comes back to uh, autonomy. And uh, that is about handing over the, con letting go of the control and giving the employee control. In those cases, those are internal projects where we offer a few constraints. One is we want you to work in our area of expertise uh, and we want you to do it within two to three months. Now go do what you think is best. And, and that's a key part is doing what you think is best. And now that they have that freedom, they have a freedom to explore and they have a freedom to do great work. And if that happens at the coffee shop or if that happens somewhere else, that's, that's fine. Because the other thing about creativity and productivity is it doesn't always happen in that, that one place. So if I ask you, when, when was the last time you had a great idea? It was probably on a plane or in the shower. Exactly. So uh, that, is, that, that is almost a predictable response because ideas happen outside of, of these four walls that we, that we call a workplace. So if you're no longer controlling the process as a traditional 20th century leader, how do you guide it in the way that makes sense to the rest of the world and especially to the clients that you're working with? I, I, think, uh, I think you still need some degree of direction. You, see, you still need to have uh, a focus on quality, but you also, you still, that, that freedom is one of those, those things that we have to change, which is uh, if I'm not in control, there's going to be chaos. And if I don't hold the reins tightly, then uh, pandemonium will ensue. It's actually the opposite. And again, so the other policy we have is manding, all, all meetings are optional. For a lifetime at Microsoft, uh, nothing if, but, meetings, nothing Microsoft, but meetings all day, yeah. the last thing I want to do is force people to have meetings. And so we make every meeting optional, including our company meetings. And uh, again, that's the freedom that people have the choice How to make. How do you handle that? If you have a really important thing you need to discuss, say that you've just lost a client or something like that, and the key person just doesn't show up, how do you do your business? We tell them what the agenda is, and you make the decision on whether you want to attend or not. Now, so what are grounds for firing then? In your, in your, uh, in your grounds company? for firing are, are failure to deliver on quality. So that's the thing, it's your, your metrics for measuring someone's performance isn't about how frequently they're on time. Your metrics performance is how good their quality of their output is. And if you can get beyond that, and I, trust me, this is something as a, as a business owner that takes a while to let go of, which is this person's coming in, it's quarter to 11, uh, what's going on? Uh, you have to let that go. And that's one of the hardest things as, as, uh, as an owner. Uh, but what you don't know is that they were probably there till midnight last night. This is all very interesting, especially in this tech-infused professional world here in the Pacific Northwest, because with the passing of Steve Jobs, with his autobiography, the biography, um, there's a sense that his unique personality and how hard he was on people. Uh, there was a blog post I saw recently that CEOs all of a sudden feel like they have a license to be really yeah. awful people because they yeah. think that they have to bully people to get things mm -hmm. done. What you're talking about is exactly the opposite. Absolutely. But Steve Jobs was seen as a very creative person who was able to bring soul to technology. Mm -hmm. So how do you contrast what you do with somebody as successful as Steve Jobs? I think there's an, an acknowledgement that there's different types of leadership. And uh, what he did for Apple and uh, was appropriate, and that was his mode of, of leadership. My, I, had, I read the same book, and I had the same fear that we're just going to have uh, many, many unpleasant people out there acting uh, inappropriately. But the thing they, don't, they need to realize is that they're not Steve Jobs. Right? The, the, you know, he, a unique he, talent. He, to, yeah. yeah, so he had a special uh, license to do that. For me, uh, it's when we think about that, that quality and the, and the quality of life, it's the quality of these relationships. And I want to enable people to do 
the best work, and that doesn't mean me berating them. And, and so that's for you, for you as a leader. How about your employees? Can they do they hold themselves and each other accountable as well? Uh, yeah. So there's uh, without going too deep, but there's a, there's certainly a psychology of, of peer pressure. Uh, those that are that are carrying the load, but that doesn't come from us. And I, I think it's better that it comes uh, from their peer group. When we when we try and evaluate performance, it happens from their peer level. It doesn't really happen from above. Well, I think that's a really unique way of looking at how to do business mm -hmm. and how to lead. So you've heard from Coach Peter Fewing from the Pika community and Gavin Kelly at the top of entrepreneurship. When we return, we'll bridge these peaks. Can we create a new model for leadership by combining their successful philosophies?